Hello and welcome to Bearded Veteran Creates, my name is Mike and today we're going to be taking a look at the Dapol Model Railway Company's 00 gauge static model of an English Electric Class 55 Deltic locomotive. It's going to be the first episode of a series of videos taking a look at the building of the kit, whilst also having a look at the history and the engineering around the Deltic locomotive. But first, let's take a look at what we get in the kit. So let's start with the obvious. This kit is more than a little different to what modelers are used to these days, not only in terms of kit packaging, but also in terms of the type of model, because we don't see the static plastic train kits all that much anymore. Unless, of course, you're specifically looking for them online or buying a model shop that's willing to stock a kit that might hang around for a bit. Speaking of which, this kit is obviously designed to hang from a carousel stand or bag rack, rather than take up valuable shelf space. Which to me says that Dapol knew that it, this wasn't likely to be a sought after kit, but more of an impulse buy, maybe as a mojo kit or a kit for someone starting out in a hobby that's looking for a cheap kit to learn and practice with. One thing that's for sure is that they never expected it to be a big seller. Anyway, let's take a closer look. In the top left we can see the Dapol logo, which I personally think is a bit small, but given they've done the Kitmaster logo much larger directly below it. It could be that they wanted to play on the memories of the, shall we say, more senior train modeler. I'll explain why I think that might be the case shortly, but overall, the whole card looks very neat and not at all cluttered, so for now, let's crack on. Below the logos we have the double O and HO symbol. Now I've been asked a few times why companies put them together when they're two different sizes, and the reason is that even though double O is 176.2 scale and HO is 187 scale, they both use 16.5mm width or gauge track. And this because in the UK the standard gauge or width is 4 foot 8 and a half inches or 143.5 centimetres thanks to Mr Stevenson and his Manchester to Liverpool Railway which is potentially a whole other video of people who are interested in that sort of thing. But back to my main point, how did we get to the 16.5 millimetres? Well, if you remember, in the UK the standard railway gauge is 1435 millimetres. Before World War I, we had O scale, which was 1 to 43.5. Then World War I happened. After World War I, toy manufacturers decided they want to make scale models that were more suitable for the home rather than in shops. So they started to create the half O scale, which was 187. And if you divide 1435 millimeters by 87, you get 16 and a half millimeters. However, they realized that because of the designs of the locomotives at the time and the fact they had to use clockwork mechanisms, they couldn't fit the mechanisms inside the models. So they created a slightly larger models known as double O gauge, which was 176.2. And because the sizes were so similar, toy companies decided that there wasn't any point in creating new size tracks, so they stuck to the standard 16.5 millimeters. So given that technology has moved on so much, why we still got both gauges. Well, HO and double O are different sizes, and they don't tend to run very well together. Also, because double O gauge has become pretty much the dominant gauge in the UK, if they cut off double O gauge, then they would lose massive customer base, whereas HO scale is more popular overseas. So if they cut that one off, then they would lose a huge part of that market. So for the companies, it makes a lot more sense just to produce different locomotives, different rolling stock in both scales. But yeah, that's why. Plus it also means that they can make smaller versions of particularly large locomotives without the consumer having to buy a different size track, which could put them off. A good example of this is the big boy locomotive from Revel, which is 187 scale, or hate joke, it measures in at 48 centimeters long when built. Yet it still fits the same track as a 176.2 or double O scale model models, even though a double O scale version would be 54.9 cm or 6.9 cm longer than a 187 scale. Anyway, back to the card, and on the right we have a printed sticky label showing the finished model along with the kit's name, number and barcode. And as we move on you can see that the kit is stapled into a clear plastic bag along with the instructions. I find it's always handy to keep these bags as they're quite big, measuring in at 30 by 175 centimetres, which means they can be pretty useful as small rubbish bags on your desk or for putting models in when you're packing them away or transporting them. That way your chosen padding doesn't rub directly against the paint. Looking at the reverse of the card, we have the history of the tools and moulds used to create this series of kits and their range of track size models. There's also a brief explanation as to why there is likely to be some flash and mismoulded parts which would normally be unacceptable, but as I've said, given that the moulds are over 60 years old and were thought to be lost so weren't maintained until Dapol found them, it's a small price to pay for such a unique kit in my opinion. And at the bottom of the card we have the contact details for Dapol and the QR code which takes you to their website www.dapol.co.uk. The instructions are a lot different to what we're used to getting with plastic model kits these days. 
as Apple recreated the instructions that would have been issued with the kits when they were originally produced by Rosebud Kitmaster between 1959 and 1962. They also show how far we've come with printing in the last 60 years, as at that time it was far cheaper and easier to print the written words than it was to print diagrams. The kit instructions tended to rely heavily on written instructions and less so on diagrams, whereas now, written instructions are almost unheard of with modern kits due to a huge advancement in computer software and printing technology, making the diagrams far easier to produce and print. There are exceptions to this of course, but they tend to be smaller companies like Accurate Armour who tend to use photographs of the model and written instructions. On the top left hand side we have the same information as on the front of the packaging card, except underneath we have a disclaimer explaining why the numbers on the kit might not match those in the instructions. On the right we once again see the advice to rely on the diagram rather than written instructions, and below that we have the start of the instructions. And as you can see, that at least a basic knowledge of train components would be helpful due to the component names being used. However, it would be possible to build the model using a diagram alone, thanks largely to there only being 55 parts in the kit, which are really easily distinguishable from one that's on the diagram. It's also worth noting that the instructions are a single side of A4 paper, so the diagram is quite large, taking up almost the entire width of the page. At the bottom of the page, we have the remaining 15 steps followed by a short paragraph on how to do the decals, and a slightly longer paragraph entitled Warranty. This paragraph basically explains that it's not unusual to be loved by anyone. Wait, I mean, parts to get bent in storage, and all you need to do is to use warm water and gentle bending to bend the piece back into shape. However, if it is damaged beyond use, then you should take the kit back to the retailer you bought it from, as the contract they have with Dapol says they must replace the kit. Finally, it explains that Dapol do not stock, hold or distribute any individual parts for these kits. Along with the instructions, we also have an info sheet, which I love. It explains how Dapol came to find the Deltic moulds, which were believed to be lost. It also tells us that the only reason they were able to reproduce the instructions is because scale modellers and collectors like you and me were able to provide them with the original copies. Finally, it tells us how other modellers have been able to improvise the window pieces, the moulds for which have long since been lost to time. Now before we take a look at the kit, I have to make an admission, and that's that I didn't originally intend to do this as a kit review, but I didn't take any photos of the actual kit prior to building. However, we can at least get an idea of the quality of the kit from the footage of the build. In terms of actual sprues, there's absolute bare minimum in this kit, with just enough to hold the smaller parts of the kit, such as the buffers, seats and wheels. The styrene is pretty chunky, which could make them useful for scratch building in future projects, but with them being pretty hard, I wouldn't recommend using snips on them other than to remove the parts for this kit. Considering the age of the moulds and the warnings on the packaging and the instructions, the actual moulding isn't that bad, and other than a bit of minor flash on the smaller parts, there's nothing here that can't be dealt with. In terms of rejection and injection marks, yes they're there, but they aren't anywhere where they can't be easily dealt with. There are some very obvious sink marks in the seats, but they can easily be filled and painted over, and other than that, it's just a case of cleaning up the sprue points and tidying up some of the seams. And finally, whilst you're hardly going to be amazed by the detail in this kit, for a 60 year old moulding of a diesel locomotive that had little external detail anyway, what detail there is is cleanly moulded with nice strong lines which should create enough visual interest to make a nice little model. So, based on initial inspection, what do we think of the kit? Me personally, given that there aren't many plastic model train kits on the market anyway, and even fewer that are based on diesel locomotives, I'd say that this is a pretty special kit to start with, especially when you take into account the history behind it. Also, given that the model train industry is essentially the reverse of the rest of the scale model industry, in so much that I think models are the exception rather than the rule, which is something that's unlikely to change anytime soon unless a lot more static scale modelers start taking an interest in the train side of the hobby. The fact that Dapol decided to invest the level of money, time and effort into producing these kits that they did is very impressive, especially when you consider that they would have to sell 10 of these kits just to take the same money as they would for a single electric model of the same locomotive. As I said at the beginning, these kits are very different to what we as static scale modelers have become used to, and I don't think that's such a bad thing. Because whilst this kit is very minimal, it should still look impressive when completed, especially if it's put next to the same scale vehicles in the diorama. There's also plenty of scope for scratch building parts and some basic interior detailing as well as exterior. The parts themselves are actually pretty good. The styrene takes primer really well and it's got enough detail to keep it interesting. So overall I would say that the 10 to 15 pound price tag is actually about right, especially as you end up with a 28 cm long by 4 cm wide by 6 cm tall model of a legendary locomotive with turnable wheels and bogies, 
that could fit onto any 16.5mm wide track, a 30cm straight length of which costs about £4. So that'll just about do it for this video. I hope you found it interesting, and if you did, please hit the usual buttons, and I hope to see you in the next video, where we'll be starting to put this unusual little kit together, whilst also looking at some of the engineering and history behind it. Until then, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Bye for now.